Thank you, Professor Cristina Soriano, and thanks to all of you for being here. I know there is a lot going on on campus in your lives and across the country right now, so it's um, really, I'm really grateful and um, it's wonderful to see all of you here. Um, so I'm going to be talking, well, Professor Soriano to asked me to come today to talk to you a little bit about uh, slavery and abolition in Brazil. Just to get a kind of idea, who is taking her class right now? Okay, so a lot of you. So, okay, so, so a lot of the things I might talk about might be familiar to you, uh, but maybe it might kind of give you a different angle on things at the same time. So uh, my uh, talk today is called uh, Acting African, Performance and Language in the Illegal Brazilian Slave Trade. A lot of you might have talked about maybe the slave trade to the Americas, right, from Africa to various parts of the United States, the Caribbean, South America, but also to, um, and also within these countries. But I, I want, today I want to think about its illegal nature because a lot of it was actually against the law but it happened and so I want to talk about that through some personal stories today. So today we're talking about abolition. Maybe you guys have talked about in class through the, uh, the idea of emancipation. Um, you know this isn't a quiz but where, so let's just quickly ask you guys, where's the first place in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery? You guys remember? <laughs> You know where it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's Haiti, right? And Haiti is, of course, and now a lot, all of us who study slavery and abolition, it's kind of, you can't not study Haitian history and its importance. So, you know, questions like how does slavery end? Who ends slavery? Those are, you know, kind of principal questions for historians who study uh, the slavery and abolition, whether it's laws, whether it's the slaves themselves. Uh, some people look at economic factors, etc. But these are kind of the questions that the study of slavery and abolition have been uh, kind of centered on. And what about the case of Brazil? So this is just an image by the French painter Auguste Biard, and it's celebrating abolition in the French colonies in uh, 1848. So after, of course, Haiti is abolished earlier, but in the other French colonies, it, become, it comes almost in the mid-19th century. Right? But it kind of already as an image, it's kind of narrating right, the kind of token, the sign of the, the broken chains, but also the white French official kind of declaring uh, freedom to the grateful slaves. And a very kind of similar image you also see for Brazil. Have you guys talked about Brazil a little bit in your classes? Or um, so, as you know, uh, Brazil is a was a colony of Portugal, so it speaks Portuguese. Uh, becomes independent in 1822, and it is, as you guys probably all know, it is it was the largest slave society in the Americas. So almost five million enslaved Africans were transported from uh, various parts of Africa to the uh, to Brazil compared to the half a million to the United States. Already by scale, Brazil really kind of uh, dwarfs the United States experience. But in terms of Brazil, its abolition, which is kind of celebrated in this picture uh, of the planter and the former slave shaking hands and celebrating the so-called golden law that abolished slavery in 1888. Brazil is kind of the classic example of what historians call gradual <coughs> abolition because it's an abolition that happens in many steps slowly over time. So while Spanish American nations in general mostly abolish slavery after independence by the 1850s at the latest, Brazil keeps it for much longer. Why is that? Historians have offered several explanations. So one of it is, as we were just talking about, is the consequence of Haiti. Many people saw kind of the, the, the destruction of right, the, the most prized territory in the Caribbean. The colony of the Caribbean was completely destroyed economically, but also people, many people saw kind of a racial changing of the order. Um, and so they were afraid of having another Haiti on their soil. So this led a lot of people to think, oh, we shouldn't abolish slavery immediately like Haiti's case. But also Brazil was a country where powerful politicians were also the country's major slave holders. So they had a very strong interest in maintaining their own economic base. And another consequence of Haiti was that because that the biggest producer of coffee and sugar suddenly is gone. And so it leads to actually the expansion of slavery in places like Brazil, but also Cuba and also Puerto Rico and the US South. Uh, so, you know, while as we'd like to think that the destruction of slavery in one place then ripples out, in fact, it has kind of an opposite effect where it actually encourages slavery in other places. Maybe Professor Soyano talked about this. This is what we call second slavery. 
So this second slavery in Brazil really propels Br Brazil's export economy of sugar and coffee in the 19th century. So again, many, many reasons for people to perpetuate and keep slavery in Brazil. And you know, some people say, but it looks bad, right? We want to be independent. We want to be taken seriously by Europe. But what does it mean that we have slavery? Doesn't that make us look bad? But a lot of its defenders say, but no, look, here in Brazil, if you are a slave born in Brazil, if you get manumitted, if you're freed, you can become a citizen. So look, it's not so bad. So that's how slavery's apologists defended slavery. So British, and nonetheless, British pressure, and I think Persoiana is beginning to talk about this, Britain be, play, starts to play a big role in the 19th century, pressuring other countries to abolish the slave trade, which itself had done in 1807. So under British pressure, Brazil actually abolishes the slave trade in 1831. But as we'll see, it doesn't really work. So it gets abolished again in 1850, more or less finally. And then slavery itself is abolished in 1888, and it becomes the last nation in the Americas to do so. So the historians who study the history of ab abolition or freedom, not just in Brazil, but in this space we call the Atlantic world, generally begin with Haiti and end with Brazil. And the United States becomes kind of like somewhere in between that, right? So it's kind of these bookends are Haiti and Brazil. So uh, historians, you know, while I just talked about slavery, actually, Haiti, its destruction, Haiti led to its expansion in some parts of the Americas, we generally consider slavery as being ultimately destroyed and over with its abolition in Brazil as this picture commemorates in 1888. So it gives you a nice sense of narrative and closure, right? A world that is still uh, uh, deeply is steeped in slavery, yet ultimately freedom triumphs and slavery is abolished at the, uh, the dawn, uh, on the eve of the 20th century, right? It's a kind of a nice sense of <coughs> closure. That said, do people's experiences give us these kind of satisfying, more movie-like endings? I want to think about that today. But to do so, I'm going to take a very brief detour. So I wanted to ask you guys, where do you think I'm from? Brazil. Where is that? Brazil. Brazil, OK. Any other thoughts, ideas? Where might I be from? New York. New York? <laughs> OK. Yeah, actually, I do live in New York City. Japan. Japan. San Francisco. San Francisco. <laughs> just, just curious, what, what, on what basis do you think? Brazil or San Francisco or New York. There's a very large Japanese population in Brazil. Right, there is that. There's a, the biggest uh, Japanese descended overseas population is in Brazil, around Sao Paulo. What about San Francisco? Where did Similar reasoning. Okay, of the Japanese descendants in. Okay, and some other, what, the New York, someone said from over there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's NYU, and I do live in New York City, so it's, uh, it's not incorrect. I am, you can say I am a New York. Okay. So maybe it's about you guys thought about on basis of, okay, uh, maybe my topic, right? I work on Brazil, but someone said Japan because? Your name. Because of my name, right? I have a Japanese, Japanese. I have a Japanese name. So another question, and you don't have to answer this. Can you hear an accent when I speak? I just want uh, you to just kind of ask, just keep that question in mind, and we'll come back to this later. So going back to Brazil, so I want to think today about slavery and abolition in Brazil, but through the stories of two people who actually lived through it. So these stories have very much to do with being a non-native speaker of a language. So I want to start by bringing attention to how much the way we speak, or rather, the way people hear us speak, marks us in profound ways. So the men at the center of today's talk understood the importance of speech and the way in which other people see and hear us. For them, as we will see, there was a lot at stake. I want to suggest that these men's personal stories will deeply complicate the idea shared by many historians that the 19th century Atlantic world was headed towards slavery's destruction. So let's now go to their story. So we're in Rio de Janeiro, which, today's, uh, which was back then the capital of Brazil. It's May of 1856. And here is an image of the uh, Casa de Detenção, the uh, detention center, 
And these two men are in the Casa Jikohei Sang, or the House of Correction. It's the Rio de Janeiro city penitentiary in the center. The slave jail is also here. So it's kind of a centers of like jail, detention, that are all kind of concentrated in this area. And two men are being held in the House of Correction, and they're about to be interrogated by the chief of police. But there's a slight issue. Why? It's because each of these men were, and I'm using quotes from my actual archival sources, the men were unable to express himself in Portuguese. In fact, the source says, they were so ignorant of the Portuguese language that only through an interpreter could they make themselves understood. So for this, they were considered bosal, or salt water Africans. That means a, a term that kind of uh, speaks to Africans who had only recently arrived from across the Atlantic Ocean. People who, as slave owners said, hadn't been seasoned yet. And this term, bosal, is very important, so please just kind of keep it in mind. So because these men can't speak Portuguese, the police call in an interpreter. This is a black man named José who speaks the language of Nago. Only through him could the interrogation take place. So the implication is that, is that this interpreter, too, is African and speaks at least two languages, Portuguese and Nago. Now, the Nago are, broadly speaking, the people known in English as the Yoruba, or from the present day, uh, Nigeria, more or less, in West Africa. <coughs> so what had landed these two Nago men in the penitentiary across the ocean in Rio de Janeiro? It was precisely their un inability to speak Portuguese. Because they, quote, did not speak a single word of Portuguese, the authorities surmised that they seemed to be imported as contraband. Now, why contraband? Here, let's give a little more detail on the slave trade to Brazil. So earlier, we saw that the slave trade to Brazil for, uh, across the Atlantic had been banned in 1831 <coughs> through an agreement between Great Britain and Brazil. Britain had abolished the slave trade to its own colonies in 1807 and had then taken it upon him, itself to enforce the same throughout the Atlantic world. Some people say that Britain kind of saw it as having kind of a moral authority to do so. So they, it also pressured Brazil, and the result was the law of 1831 banning the transatlantic slave trade to Brazil. So the law was there, but it was brazenly ignored. It became, in fact, known as the Lei para Inglês Ver, or the Law for British Eyes, a token law that was just there to please the British, but that no one actually followed. But from a legal standpoint, nonetheless, any African person who was brought to Brazil as a slave after this law was illegally enslaved. So first a mixed British uh, Brazilian uh, commission and then later on a Brazilian commission could seize an illegal slave ship and quote unquote emancipate those Africans on board. These emancipated Africans were known as Africanos Livres or free Africans. Despite the name however they weren't entirely free in the way that we might think of what freedom means, right? And this is slavery really complicates the idea of what freedom means, right? So this, despite this name of free Africans, they weren't really free. It was actually a liminal status that could last up to 14 years and in Brazil. And they were actually made into wards of the state because they were considered people who couldn't really care for themselves. And they were often actually kind of sent to work on public works projects and often were sent into labor, uh, positions of laboring for others. Nonetheless, it was not slavery, and that's important to remember. So in spite of these laws, the illegal slave trade, as I just, I just, as I just said, just continues on and on. Close to 760, you wanna, <laughs> so the slave trade continues, and almost 760,000 Africans were illegally transported to Brazil between 1830 in 1856, the year in which we find these men in the House of uh, Corrections. So I want you to think about that for a second. Over three quarters of a million people illegally enslaved were forced across the Atlantic after the slave trade is already abolished. So in 1850, the slave trade is abolished again, and this time it's, t it's, it's effective more or less. But many illegal slave ships still continue to appear here and there. And one such slave ship is called the Mary E. Smith, and it's captured off the Brazilian coast in January of 1856, four months prior to this investigation. 
and this interrogation of the two men. So we'll come back to this ship later, but for now what matters is that these two men, because they did not speak Portuguese, and thus seemed like they had just recently arrived from Africa, come to the police's attention. The police think, oh, maybe they were illegally enslaved Africans on this ship, the Mary E. Smith. And that's why they were sent to the House of Corrections to have their case checked out. Now, as with so many experiences in the archives where I work, like Dr. Soriano, I do go to Brazil, I work in the archives among really old documents. I came upon these documents through complete happenstance. It was by accident. I was just looking for something else. And I just, to say, I just wanted to say this is actually the joy of working in the archive and rarely do these things happen when you're just scrolling through digitized sources. So if any of you are considering it, the archives are actually a great, great place to work. But it's also worth noting for a case that rarely are these Africanos Livlis or free Africans uh, interviewed by the police. So the fact that I found these documents just makes me very lucky, but it also makes us think about why these two men were interviewed at all. Why did they come to the police's attention? So here's what we know so far as told through their interpreter, that man called Jose. So these men are named Vicente, or Vincent in English, and João, or John in English. Vicente goes first, and he's followed by João. Before their captivity, their names were Itapola and Obasa. Vicente was never baptized, while João says he was baptized in Africa. So just kind of give you an idea of where we're talking about. So they eventually end up in Salvador, in the northeast of Brazil. And now, right now, they're in Rio de Janeiro. And this is sorry, a close-up of Yoruba land in uh, current day Nigeria. And this region we'll talk about is central to their story. So both men identify themselves as belonging to the Nago nation. Do you ladies want to? <laughs> so both uh, identify themselves as being of the Nago nation. Again, roughly speaking, the Yoruba. So they're roughly of the same nation, and they speak the same African language. And these men provide a brief but rare and harrowing insight into their first and middle passage. The first passage points to their captivity in Africa. So first are the wars in Yoruba land. This is an era in the early, early to mid-19th century. There are many, many wars in West Africa. Africans are enslaving other Africans. The captives are then marched to the coast and sold to white slave traders where the uh, African and transatlantic slave trades converged. So first, Vicente said that he was taken in the war of Nago, or the wars here, by blacks from there. And then he was sent to white men, and then taken on the slave ship at Echo, or Lagos, on the coast. So just Lagos, of course, the biggest, see Nigeria, Lagos is right here. And of course, it's still the, the biggest city in Nigeria. Oops. He says that the ship that he was taken to was governed by whites, but there were other non-Nago blacks on board who were cooks. So he's not just recognizing the difference between himself as a black person and white people on the ship, but he also realizes there were Africans of different ethnic groups, not just Nagos, but other Africans on board. Joao, the second man, says that his original captor was maybe an acquaintance. He said he was, quote, first sold as a captive by a black comrade to another in his land, and then to whites in Africa, and then he was taken to the ship. He eventually departed from Brazil from the port of Jebu, which is an interior town in the southwest of Nigeria, but he too was probably sent through Lagos as well. Both men were probably transported on fairly large slavers as they recalled that their ship had three masts and uh, according to one historian, it was a standard slave ship that was, had sl three masts. So once captured in Africa, taken to the coast, put on a slave ship, what awaited them was the Middle Passage. Time had disappeared into pestilence, into darkness and terror. Neither of them could recall for sure how long ago that they had been forced to leave their homeland. Vicente recounted, quote, he came inside the hold of the ship without seeing the light. He could not recall how many had shared the journey with him, but he remembered that the hold was full of blacks who, he said, pushed one another. 
we can easily imagine a cramped, suffocating, and stench-filled place. Zhuang, too, came in the hold with many other Africans and recalled that, quote, in the heat, four of the blacks died during the voyage. The slave ship was a space of death. Vicente and Zhuang, however, survived the Middle Passage and arrived in Salvador, Bahia. So this is, a, again, a broad image of the slave trade map. So they leave from Lagos around here, and they end up in the northeast of Brazil, around here in uh, the city of Salvador. So Vicente said that his ship finally docked in Salvador, a capital, the capital of Bahia uh, province in northeast Brazil. This was a former colonial capital, and Salvador was a city that was separated into two levels. The higher city, which you can see up above, where there was the main cathedral and the central square, and the lower city here, you can see below, by the docks. Upon his arrival at a port in the lower part of the city, Vicente was introduced to another temporality. As the sun began to rise over the horizon, Vicente heard someone say, Natal or Christmas. And then, he said, other blacks explained to him that it was Christmas Eve. These other blacks who spoke his language may have well been Vicente's first introduction to a new community founded by people from his own country on Brazilian soil. Joao said that a few days after his arrival in Salvador in the same city, he and three of his shipmates from the Middle Passage were sent to work for a cigar factory uh, a cigar maker, I'm sorry, in Cachoeira, in the hinterland of Salvador. So if you can see, Salvador is um, on the bottom right corner there. He sent way into the interior to that, where that red circle is in the interior. It's also a major sugarcane producing region in Brazil, which was already on decline by this time. So if João was able to endure his first experience of captivity in Brazil with fellow survivors of the Middle Passage, in less than a year, he was separated from them. He alone was sent back from Cachoeira back to Salvador. There he was sold to a baker named Francisco Paulo Viana in the lower city. And it was at this baker's that Vicente and Joan met for the first time. So it's very important to be aware of the setting when we talk about where these men uh, had been taken to. Salvador in the middle of the 19th century was a black city. Even today, it's considered to be, and also markets itself as, the heart of African Brazil. It's kind of where people can find their true Africa within the Americas. The historian Jean Hayes has calculated that in 1857, so just a year after the time we're talking about, the combined number of slaves and freed people and free-born people of African descent formed the vast majority of the urban population. At least a quarter of the population in the mid-century, mid-19th century was African, and the vast majority of them were Nago, or came from Yoruba land, like these two men we've been talking about. So we can just imagine, right, the movement of the streets, where an urban black population worked as street vendors, as porters, as dock workers, and in our case, even as bakers. <coughs> a lot of slaves had very specialized skills. So in these urban spaces, they met, they exchanged information, they had certain corners of the city where people from the same ethnic group could kind of hang out, uh, and they formed professional bonds, social bonds. You know, maybe they had their girlfriends and boyfriends. They also maybe shared their faith and their language and their memories. So at least they found that. But after a mere three moons, or actually a lot of West African people count the time, as it's seen, through the movement of the moon. So they, after three moons, they're sold again. They're now sold to an island called Itaparica, which is across the bay from the city of Salvador. So they're on this island now for two years, and then they're sold again. And this time they go a lot farther. They're sold in the internal slave trade from the northeast to Rio de Janeiro, a very, very far south. So some of you may have studied this. The internal slave trade is when slaves are shipped within the same country or colony, right? So for the U.S., for example, there was a huge internal slave trade from the upper south to the lower south. So same, a similar thing in Brazil. So they're, on a, they're put on a ship 
that goes, leaves Salvador and goes down the coast towards Rio. And there Vicente says that he marked the difference between himself and João and the others through language. So again, he's listening to how people are talking. So when the police ask Vicente, if among those blacks sent from Bahia to Rio, Bahia meaning Salvador to Rio, were there any fellows who had come from Africa? Vicente responds that, no, it was only João. For, he said, the others were Creoles, or people who were born in Brazil, and Africans who spoke the language of the whites of Brazil. So in other words, for Vicente, the ability to speak Portuguese differentiated those Africans from himself and João, who he ins insists because they didn't speak Portuguese. So they arrive in Rio. And I don't know if some of you have been, have any, has anybody been to Brazil or to Rio? So this is kind of the famous uh, pão de açúcar, the sugar loaf, uh, which of course is still there. So these two men, who spoke no Portuguese, arrive in Rio de Janeiro. And they end up in the House of Correction, where we found them earlier in this talk. But even just so far, we can see their experiences of being bought, sold, bought, sold. They are people, but they are treated as property. It is an endless cycle of rupture, community making rupture. It starts in their homeland in West Africa and has repeated itself over and over again in Brazil. So let's briefly talk about that mysterious slave ship. So this is an image of a different uh, illegal slave ship that was caught in Jamaica about just a year after the events we're talking about. So this uh, contraband or illegal slave ship that Vicente and Joao, you know, they were suspected of being on, that I mentioned earlier, is called the Mary E. Smith. There is a huge international paper trail of this ship, and it's something that, you know, I'm working on, uh, uh, you know, we'll see what we'll find. But we should note for now, for the time being, that it was captured off the coast of northeast Brazil in January of 1856. Again, four months before these two men end up in the House of Correction where they're being interrogated. The ship sailed from Africa with 520 Africans aboard. When it arrived in Brazil, there were only 370 who had survived the Middle Passage. These survivors were emancipated, as I talked about earlier, and became legally free Africans in Brazil. But by a month later, 106 of those people had perished. I do have the slave ship register of those aboard this slave ship, the Mary Smith. And I haven't had a chance yet to go through it in detail, but from the numbers you can already see the astonishing mortality. Basically, half all the passengers, half of all the ins ins people carried on it died. It included women, men, and significant numbers of children. The capture of this ship was a huge deal, especially to Brazilians. Why? Because it was the Brazilians who captured the ship, and thus it seemed to announce to the world that Brazil was, yes, indeed, it was committed to suppressing the illegal trade. So as a result of this ship's capture, Britain offered to repeal the Aberdeen Act of 1845, which had allowed the British to seize and prosecute Brazilian illegal slave vessels in British courts. Brazil had found this law to be intrusive, insulting, and such, because basically Britain was saying, you're not capable of policing your own illegal slavery. So this capture of the ships seemed to show that Brazil was in fact capable and committed to anti-slavery. Now this ship, the Mary E. Smith, is of particular interest to those of us kind of living in New York and this kind of northeast general area. The Mary E. Smith, whose captain was from Louisiana, sailed from Boston Harbor the previous year in 1855. From Boston Harbor, it went across the Atlantic Ocean and headed for Angola in West Central Africa. And it's, during that time, it switched its flag numerous times to elude capture. And ships continue to do this often when you want to uh, elude policing. You switch the which national uh, flag you're showing to say that you're, uh, you can avoid so-and-so's jurisdiction. So the main person behind this illegal slave ship was a Portuguese man of Brazilian citizenship named Manuel Hayes. He lived in Rio de Janeiro, but his firm was based 
in Wall Street in New York City. And its front man was the consul of Portugal. So literally a diplomat. Many of these men were connected through a global network of Freemasons. So while we know that many abolitionists were Freemasons, and of course a lot of Freemasons kind of were against the idea of slavery, some also, as this turns out, used their Freemason networks for the opposite end. New York City in the 1850s was known in some circles as a free city because New York abolished slavery in 1827. That was the chief port in the world of the slave trade. Thus, curious connections begin to emerge between the southern and northern Atlantic worlds, the worlds of Brazil and of Angola, with the worlds of Europe and the United States, through the illegal slave trade and a dizzying global circulation of capital. Many historians have also noted that southern U.S. pro-slavery interests were collaborating closely with these New York City firms, believing that their prosperity depended on the renewal of the slave trade. So there's a lot of interest in the U.S. in reopening the slave trade from Africa. And so that's also kind of affecting what's happening in the Atlantic world in Brazil and Cuba also. We can talk about that a little bit. So you can begin to see that while we're talking about slavery in Brazil, it is also a history of the United States of Africa, of Europe. And focusing on the illegal slave trade, I think really upends some ideas even about the U.S. North's opposition to slavery. So what do we know? What happened to Vicente and João? Were these two men who didn't speak a word of Portuguese? Were they on the Mary E. Smith? Are these two men Bolsal or saltwater Africans? And just so you know, this isn't an image of them, but it's an image of a 19th century enslaved person from Yoruba land. So I think they probably looked kind of very similar, or very likely had similar scarification patterns. So here's what the police concluded. First, they said, Vicente and Joan were not on the Mary E. Smith because the Africans on them were Congo, or from West Central Africa, Angola region, while Vicente and Joan were, as we know, Nago from West Africa. They were from completely different parts of Africa. And also their testimonies in Rio de Janeiro had shown that they had actually been in Brazil since long before the Mary Smith was apprehended. Okay, but then things take a very curious turn. Vicente and Joan are deemed not to be Bolsal or saltwater Africans. Why? Because they speak Portuguese. What do you mean they speak Portuguese? The whole point was that they didn't speak Portuguese. The two men had caused such consternation in Rio that they were sent back north to Salvador in June, m a month after they testified using an interpreter, right? So they had spoke, they used the interpreter, they said, we don't speak Portuguese, we only speak the language of Nago, an interpreter comes. And a month later, they speak Portuguese. So they're sent back to Bahia where they're questioned by the chief of police of Bahia, a man named Francisco Liberatos de Matos. And Matos remarked, they responded in Portuguese to the various questions I asked. Finding this situation very odd, Matos then reported it to the president of the province of Bahia. Each, uh, it's like a governor of each province. Who in March, actually this president was the very man who was the chief police of Rio, because important men played an ascending set of musical chairs. So he was the very man who had originally ordered Vicente and Joan to be sent to the House of Correction in the first place. And it was he who had initially observed that these two did not speak a word of Portuguese. The president interrogated Vicente and Joan himself. He sat them down. And the two men, what do they do? They respond to him in Portuguese without an interpreter. And on top of that, they even declared to the president that they recognized him from Rio. Like, hey, like we just met a month ago. What's going on? Like, so people are completely flabbergasted. So what in the world is going on? Did Vicente and Joan miraculously learn Portuguese in just one month? Or is something else at stake? So the police chief who was interrogating them succeeded in locating the men's former owners who identified the two and concluded that they had arrived in Brazil 
around 1841, right during those years between the two laws prohibiting the transatlantic slave trade, right, 1831, then 1850, along with hundreds of thousands of other illegally enslaved Africans. So Matos, the police chief, half-heartedly acknowledged that the men entered Brazil when the, as he said, the illicit commerce of Africans was tolerated and done publicly with great scandal to the point that it was nearly licit. Say that again. When the illicit was nearly licit. And of course, we're not here talking about people smoking weed on the street or something. This is about the enslavement of trafficking of people from their homelands, hundreds of thousands of them, forced across the Atlantic so that they can labor for others as their property. And we already know now that what enabled this was not just a few bad apples in a couple of Brazilian cities. No, it was a global network profiting from human lives that reached from Brazil to Cuba to the United States to Africa and various countries in Europe in a world that was supposedly embracing with ever greater fervor the cause of anti-slavery. It was those global interests that led Vicente and Joao one day in May 1856 to be in the House of Correction in Rio de Janeiro. So what do we make of them? Who are these guys? What was their deal? Why did they perform as Bolsal Africans in Rio de Janeiro? And then why did they just abandon that act once they were sent back to Salvador? What had language capacity and the apparent lack thereof attained for these two men? One way to answer these questions is hinted at by Matos, the Bahian police chief. He surmised that, and this is a quote, if two African slaves named Vicente and João had appeared in Rio, completely ignorant of the Portuguese language and were bolsal, either they were substitutes, as in they were in fact different people, or they pretended to be bolsal as a means to obtain freedom. Now at this moment, I don't yet know if Vicente and João were freed once they arrived in Salvador. That may become evident through further research, and I really hope so. But if they were freed because they arrived after 1831, that means that almost every other enslaved African in Brazil would have to be freed throughout the entire country, and nobody was ready for that. However, by returning to Salvador, the two men did regain something important, and I think that that was their community. After so many ruptures and so many years away from their homeland and their families and everything that was familiar to them, perhaps they had accepted that they would not, at least not yet, return to their homeland. But here in Salvador, to which they did return, they were among other Nagos. It wasn't home, but it was a home. It was a home that they had lost when they were sent to Rio in the internal slave trade, where there were a handful of Nagos among an overwhelmingly West Central African population, speakers of a totally different language from a totally different part of Africa. So while their gamble to be emancipated in Rio failed, their convincing performance as Bosal or recently arrived Africans had enabled them to gain other things. Acting so well as saltwater Africans, had garnered the personal attention of some of the most powerful men in all of Brazil, including the future Minister of Justice and the President of the Senate. And while these two men, at least so far, weren't freed, they were go able to go back to Salvador. And once they returned there, perhaps they decided that there was no more need to act Bosal. Vicente and Joan, I think, were very perceptive men. They were keenly aware that free Africans, if they were uh, successfully recognized as such, gained special protection from the state. But they also knew the prejudices governing these men with the power to decide their fate. For instance, the same police chief of Bahia, who guessed correctly that the two men were only pretending to be Bosal, insisted that Vicente and Joao were Bosal nonetheless, so he's basically contradicting himself. Why? Because he said they had, 
one, either been employed outside the city and lived more among their fellows than with those of the country of Brazil, or, he said, or for being minimally stupid, they did not become so Ladino or acculturated, as do others who have spent much less time in Brazil. So basically, even after recognizing Vicente and Joan's ability to speak Portuguese and even to manipulate the authorities with their spectacular performance, the police chief simply could not look past the thick lens of what he thought a bolsal was. That is, someone who chose not to socialize with, Bra with Brazilians and adapt Brazilian ways. Or worse, someone who is stupid. To be bolsal then was perhaps much more about what Brazilians thought a salt water or an unseasoned African would be like, rather than an accurate depiction of an African person's experience in Brazil or anywhere else in the Americas. And Vicente and Joan knew how to play into these stereotypes, like a kind of slavery code switching. For when you are one among hundreds of thousands of people who are illegally enslaved just like you, but living as de facto slaves, what options do you have? What can two illegally enslaved men do to change their circumstances when law enforcement and global interests were invested in profiting from their condition? Vicente and Joan, I think, recognized that it was all a show, and this show was put on by Brazilian politicians and law enforcement of this new nation who were playing the part of anti-slavery and committing a commitment to upholding the law on a global stage. So they were, I think, performing anti-slavery. So I think these two guys decided to respond with their own performance as Bolsal Africans for a shot at something that maybe wasn't freedom exactly, but it wasn't slavery either. So just to conclude, I just wanted to say that, for, if anything, this story opens up many, many questions, right? Some of them is like, what, hap what does it mean to be a, a bolsal or saltwater, a recently arrived person, as opposed to someone who's been around longer, who's acculturated? How do you decide? Is it the way you look? Is it the way you dress? Is it the way you talk? Is it who you hang out with? But it also raises interesting methodological questions for the historian. How do we work with lies and half-truths? We know Vicente and Joan invented some things. Does that invalidate their stories altogether? But if so, then how do we deal with the knowledge that even upholders of the law can't be taken for their word? Or maybe it's the lies that matter. And maybe we should be less interested in the truth. Finally, how are we to understand the history of slavery and abolition and freedom, these ideas that are so foundational to the narrative of the Atlantic world, when we see that enslavement, legal and illegal, continue to reign supreme? And furthermore, in a world where various forms of forced labor would emerge in this world of Atlantic anti-slavery? So I just kind of wanted to end it with that question. And as a side note, going back to the question I asked first, where am I from? Any other ideas? Do you, do you those remember, said it earlier, do you, do you remain wedded to your initial assumptions? I'm from Tokyo. I'm born in Japan. I came here when I was 18 to go to college, and my family speaks no English. Um, so when I say that, people often say, oh, oh yeah, I can hear an accent. So, <laughs> thanks. Okay, so we're up for uh, questions, comments, anything you want to share with uh, Dr. Nikki? Or if you just want to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? Uh, Chiki. Yes. Thank you. First, I have to apologize. I came oh. in late. Uh, but thank you so much for this very insightful uh, presentation. I'm actually interested in the very one of the last questions you posed. How do we deal? How do historians, I take it, deal with lies and half truths? Uh, and I wanted to probe a little bit more into that uh, as far as um, 
oral narratives, oral histories mm -hmm. are concerned. Uh, in that particular kind, in that particular form or rendering of history, either in his fact, you know, in his semi factuality or in performance as an artistic, you know, uh, presentation, um, do historians or, or how do you when when you get such oral narratives or oral accounts, mm -hmm. are you how much consideration yeah. is given to context? Is given to the you know the context in which that particular narrative is offered. Uh, is it just talking to you, or is the subject talking in context of a <coughs> gathering? Mm -hmm. uh, so do those, you know, so when, when, when those kinds of factors, and these are all variables, you know, age, mm -hmm. demography of that context and everything, mm -hmm. when, that come, when all those considerations come into play, do you even, is there even any need to still think about what is being offered mm -hmm. in terms of truth or half-truth or lies at all? Is, does it even matter at that point? Yeah, um, I guess I could think about it in two ways, and I'm sure because many of you have taken Professor Soriano's class, and maybe if you've taken Latin American history classes, we often talk about sources, right? Sources always an issue, and of course, for those of us who run to write about slaves, um, or also, I also write about indigenous people, they almost, they don't, you know, especially if you work outside of the United States, they don't have slave narratives. And those are also shaped sources, but you don't have a slave telling their personal story. The sources we have are things like interrogations with the police, or sometimes maybe there was an insurrection scare and they're arrested. So they're often, these testimonies are given in, in context of coercion and fear. And sometimes they're even tortured, right, to give um, these testimonies. So, you know, then do we say we just they're just worthless because they're they were coerced in some way or they're maybe they shaped their narrative because of these conditions and I think it's a debate that we will continue to have but what does it mean then to throw it out entirely right because then you literally use silence you're saying there there's no value we have we cannot hear their voices at all let's just uh, they cannot participate as historical actors so of course we would argue that we can't do that but I think it's still important to think about the context and sometimes it's more evident than others right sometimes you can see oh, wait, there's an abolitionist lawyer representing this guy, but they kind of appear on the sides. Or, But in this case, um, I think it was just more evident than in other cases because of their very specific context. They were actually putting on this show of, I can't speak, I need an interpreter, etc. cetera. Um, but, I, but I wanted to get something out of that and to just really understand that these men were literally kind of just, you know, this was like the only chance they had. So they're like, let's go for this and see what we can do about it. And I wanted to recognize that rather than saying, oh, Maybe they made this all up, so who cares? There's something much more interesting that's happening. And it was also interesting because in, 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 in an earlier iteration, I, I was talking about this with an anthropologist, and he said, we anthropologists have much less <laughs> we're, we're much less wedded to the truth than historians. <laughs> and I was like, oh, OK. Um, but he actually kind of helped me realize that I was too fixated on trying to understand whether I could verify what they said. Can I find the records for their entry? And, their, and I was like, maybe that's not the point. And actually, what's more interesting is that they were lying, and to what end? So, um, and, and I, th I think all of us struggle with this. In a class I'm teaching right now, we, we read Latin American testimonios, like narratives by indigenous people who are victims of like, uh, violence and genocide. And a famous one, Igoberta Mencho, she's been denounced, some, this North American anthropologist, said, oh, she made it all up, like I tried to verify her story, it's not true, she's a liar. But there's something that's truthful more in not the accuracy in the, the way you can verify everything they said, but the fact that they're able to, as one person said, speak truth to power. That there is something more important in their speaking in itself rather than the way in which we think it's accurate about being able to investigate every single detail. So in a way, yeah, maybe that's, I don't know if I alluded, but I think there's something more important than just trying to see if we can verify everything. Right. Yeah. But it's still something that I need to work out kind of in my head, but thank you. Mm -hmm. um, did you guys, I don't know if you guys read Trio. Uh, no. Okay, so there's a really amazing Haitian historian named Michel Rolf Trio, and he passed away um, too early a few years ago, but he really kind of breaks it down where what we think is fact is also very much a political act, right? So, you know, even something like Columbus discovered the Americas, is that a fact? 
you know, like it, things that we might take for granted as fact is already there's a narrative that's part of like what we might consider. Or even if we talk about there was, uh, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, some people say, or in Ferguson, if you Google riot, you get one kind of picture. If you look at protest, you get a different kind of picture, right? You can maybe say it was a riot or it was a protest. Both people claim as a fact, but they're not created equally. So I, I kind of, I think it's kind of a false, uh, certain things you can say for granted, like this law was passed in 1831. But I think a lot of other things that we might think of as fact, it's actually much more going into it than the creation of the fact than we might think for granted. So um, I think it's important to be more specific, like even with a case like this, I could say, sure, I can think about in relationship to the laws, but, um, you know, like, it's, they're, they're very unclear about when they came to Brazil. Maybe they did on purpose, maybe they can't remember. Um, and maybe I, I can find them on the registry of, a slave, of the ships that were coming, and maybe I can't. But, you know, I think it's always kind of a, a balance that you have to um, figure out. But I think I'll just say, maybe I, what I would say for now is that don't think that facts are neutral. And I think it's actually very important in this current climate, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, in fact, you know, meaning is contextual. Mm -hmm. We are trying to create meaning of these narratives, mm -hmm. being partly from the police, partly <coughs> from uh, the subjects themselves, mm -hmm. partly from the interpreters. So we have several filters where meaning is created, mm -hmm. and this is intimately tied to power, to positions of Absolutely. power. Mm -hmm. to sort of outsmart mm -hmm. their captors and the police. So I think this is what we might have to look at, you know, how power manipulates the discourse. Mm -hmm. so yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And also our, in our role as historians or, or other types of critics, mm -hmm. how we see these things, and we are also interpreters. Mm -hmm. we absolutely. Right, right, and it's I, and um, thank thank you for that. I would just say that it's especially important for those of us who study, for instance, social historians who study slaves or indigenous people or, you know, uh, illiterate people, peasants, etc., because they don't create their own sources. So it's very dangerous to try to just take the source that's created by, let's say, a policeman who wants to keep them enslaved and take it as fact. Right? He calls them stupid. Etc. What am I supposed to say? Oh, there is no. That's it's obviously there's a reason why he's saying that. So it's 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 our job, I think, to read um, it critically. But I think it's very it's a slippery slope, and I think sometimes historians unwittingly kind of replicate what the sources are saying without knowing. So I think you have to we have to be very aware of what we're doing ourselves, right? Because the historian, the facts are not neutral, but also the historian's never neutral. So I think it's important that we're aware of our own position. Yeah. Well, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you.